Hello and thank you for joining us on Newsweek, where we highlight some of the biggest stories that made the headlines in the week. I am Jacinta Ubiuku. This week, the Independent National Electric Commission, INEC, has delisted more than 1.1 million names from the voters' re register as the electoral body continues a uh, biometric identification process ahead of the 2023 elections. INEC said the registrants involved were those that registered between 28 June 2021 and 14th January 2022. Also, the People's Democratic Party, PDP, appoints governors Odomi Mano and Amino Tambuwa to lead the Atiku presidential campaign. River State uh, Governor Nelson Wike, who has been at the center of the party's crisis, was listed as a member of the council as well as his ally, Governor Samuel Otom of Benue State. Later on the show, we will take a look at the rising cost of living across Nigeria as the country's inflation rate surges to 16-year high at 20.5%. All the details in a moment. Stay with us. Well, we'll begin with electoral matters, where the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, says it has delisted 1.1 million newly registered voters from its database ahead of 2023 general election. INEC National Commissioner and Chairman of Information and Voter Education Committee, Festus Okoye, spoke during the cleaning up of the voters register using the automated biometric identification system where he said the commission detected several double multiple and ineligible registrations okoye said out of the 2.5 million fresh registration done between 28 june 2021 and 14th january 2022 1.1 million records were found to be invalid and consequently delisted he also noted that INEC will display the voter register once the process of verification is concluded, adding that permanent uh, voter card services for all valid registrants are also expected to be available for collection by the end of October or early November. Well, joining me now via Zoom for more discussion on this is a lawyer, Olaika Ola Daniels. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good evening. All right. Now, 1.1 to 6 million people assumed they had registered to vote, only to be delisted. What do you make of this? Um, well, I think uh, we need to correct an impression first, and that has to do with uh, the delisting. Now, the INEC does not have any right INEC does not have any power to delist voters registration, they do not. Now, what INEC has power to do is to make sure that any invalid voters registration can what can be set aside and can, I mean, can be declared invalidated because there are processes in which an individual is supposed to register with INEC. Now, if these processes are not followed, so what do we take of it? There are rules. If there are no rules, surely things, we, there will be chaos and things we know, all of us will still come back and, and scream and shout that INEC has, com has compromised. Now, what are these issues? If anyone, because the law is clear, if uh, like uh, under section 12, subsection 1 of the Electoral Act, it talks about the age and it says 18 and above. That is the only time you can register as, uh, I mean, a proposed voter, a registrant must be 18 and above. So if your age is below 18, of course, during the cleanup exercise of INEC, all that will be de detected. If you have, in fact, there's this, um, there's this, um, 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 there's this false rumor 
or first uh, um, information that have been going around uh, people saying that the INEC uh, and the voters card before 2011 is invalid, that you cannot use it to vote. Based on this false information, a lot of people went again to the portal when INEC opened portal for re re registration to register their can I mean to, to register their candidates as a voter as a, as a voter in this country. Now, what do you get when you see that? It means that you're going to have a multiple registration on an individual. So, do we then allow all these numbers? Do, are we asking INEC to because we really need to be careful? Are we asking INEC to then leave multiple registrations for? such uh, uh, exercise is my, my my answer is capital no so if you have someone that are done to register again because it be, is working based on false information that oh the INEC uh, the voters card he had before 2011 does not i mean it's not valid that he cannot use it it is wrong that, that's not true it is false up an issue so if you then go and register it means that is invalid two there are multiple People, in fact, I, I, I had to check uh, a number of the queries INEC raised as to you see names, you see somebody registering and putting 900, 1900, it was burned. And you see a man picture as against a female uh, uh, name as sex, a uh, female uh, in the sex uh, uh, gender. So those are issues. So if we have people, then a lot of people don't have, I mean, probably they don't even know what to put, and there are some names. So all these oh, things... Oh, of the, course, the, the, based the, on the, that, you know. Mr. Lanka, I just want to um, get your view. If you think that uh, uh, there was voter education um, enough by INEC to the voters while registering, do you think um, uh, they had this voter education fast enough for the people to know what to do and what not to do? Well, when we talk about voters' education, so look, um, one thing I have learned over time, and I've also tell our people over time, all this thing should not, all this blame should not be dropped at the tables of some of these agencies. On voters' registration, we've been on this for a number of years. We're not talking about the people that, that are clocking 18. We're not talking about people that are just talking it in. There are people that, I mean, they were, we, we know people of, uh, I mean, uh, eligible age to register. They never did. I made, there were, there were an awareness everywhere. There, I mean, publications everywhere, informations everywhere. Yes, I can say maybe it's not enough. Maybe the, voter, uh, the, the uh, electoral education, the voters' education is not enough because we still find some people don't to, or also know how to fill the forms. While they are doing that, I'm sure there are a number of you, and don't forget, because you're an illiterate does not invalidate you being a registrant. Because if you're an illiterate, you can still get someone that will put you through in the process of that registration. Because we, you cannot, we cannot, de, no, no one should disenfranchise someone because he didn't go to school or because he has uh, maybe little or basic education. So in this matter, I think the, the, when we talk about uh, the electoral education as well from INEC, I think it's a continuous thing. It's what we should continue. Why? Because we still have a lot of people that are really not in the known of what is happening. So, because if we have over 18 million, we're talking about Nigeria, we're allegedly saying that we are 200 million, then if we then add over, I mean, having around 80 million registered voters, it means that we still have work to do. It still means that a lot of people are still, I mean, behind uh, at scene that are, not, that are not part of this exercise. So that I can say for INEC, there's still more work to, to be done. They, they still need to come out and, educate people, but the truth be told, number of people that particularly came out uh, among the 12 million, uh, I mean, uh, new registered uh, voters, we, I mean, the, the, some of those people are not new. They are not people that just clock 18. Maybe if we take the percentage of the, the, the 18, uh, uh, the, the age, that just attained age, as a, I mean, 18 as at the time of registration, maybe it would be minimal compared to some people that are far above that age, but they have not gone out to do so because they have denied themselves of that right, to their, civil, their own civic right, to go and exercise their own franchise. So no one should, they should not come here and complain that anybody wants to disenfranchise them 
in as much as I know that also INEC has a lot of work to do. All right, Mr. Laika, thank you so much for your contribution so far, but we'll have to go on a short break now, and Newsweek continues in a moment. Stay with us. You welcome back, and it's still Newsweek, where we discuss the biggest stories that made the headlines in the week. Now let's turn our attention to politics. With about two weeks to the start of presidential campaign for the 2023 elections, the People's uh, Democratic Party, PDP, has appointed Governor of Akwaibom State, Odomi Mano, as the chairman of its presidential campaign council. The PDP also appointed Governor of Sokoto State, Aminu Tambawa, as Director General of the party's National Campaign Management Committee. The appointments were contained in a statement signed by the party's National Organizing Secretary, Omar, uh, Omaru Baturi. Governor Imano will be supported by governors of Bauchi, Bala Mohammed, and Oyoshi Makinde to run the Presidential Campaign Council. And Director General of the National Campaign Management Committee, Governor Tambowa, will be supported by four deputies. Former Cross River State Governor Leo Imoke, Professor Adewale Oladipo, Raymond Dokwepsi, and former Governor of Enugu State Ukwesilieze Wodo. Well, I still have Barrister Olainka Ola Daniels with me via Zoom. Now, Mr. Olainka, Governors uh, Amino Tambuwa and Udom Imano are to lead the presidential. Uh, campaign council of PDP. Are you really surprised at the emergence of both men? Well, um, I'm not surprised. <laughs> uh, I'm not surprised at all. And uh, we see this coming. And um, uh, well, like we all know, politics is local. So everyone, all hands are to be on deck. And every politician first intention is how to win an election so and every strategy they need to put in place now if you look at some crises that uh, i mean uh, over time that pdp had really suffered i mean that have created setback for them um you will find out that in a way to bring everybody back they just have to go this route you know you have uh, i mean uh, someone from the south and you have also from the not uh, central. So you can't but have someone, I mean, uh, people from that to lead the campaign already, if the chairman is from the not and the uh, presidential candidate also is because that is one of the issues that some of the uh, party members have with, uh, with PDP, that we cannot have a presidential candidate from the north and as well, having the chairman of the party from the same, uh, I mean, zone. So why can't we just have, I mean, someone from other, uh, I mean, zone, uh, um, being uh, the, maybe the chairman, why we are presidential from the North, since we have given ticket to the North. Having said that, I think the presidential candidate also has a lot to do here. He has a lot of role to play and to make sure that the house is in order to call all the, I mean, aggrieved members of the party to see how this can function well. Now, going to Tambora and going to Moki, we can see that these are uh, two personalities that, um, that are key factors in this party. And uh, for sure, they know what they are doing. I think they, from what I can see, I think they are getting their calculation in place, whether it will work, whether it will not work, it is not in my place to state, but I think uh, it's, a, it's a welcome development, and I think that can give them, uh, I mean, a head over the crisis that they are facing. All right, Mr. Lanka Daniels, let me also find out from you that all PDP governors are in the presidential campaign council, uh, including Nelson Wiki and Ike Paramandu, who is standard trial in the UK. Do you see Governor Wiki accepting this offer and working with uh, Atiku? Well, don't forget, <laughs> like I said, politics is, uh, uh, is local. Unfortunately, politics also is perma per permanent interest. No enemy, no 
no friend, no permanent friends, no permanent enemy in politics is, is about interest and it's a person, uh, I mean, uh, permanent interest. So on uh, Wiki, uh, I don't see Wiki leaving uh, PDP and I don't see Wiki in the end not working with Atiku. I think all that is required here is for everybody to drop their guard, to drop their ego and come to the round table and look at, I mean, probably they need to come to, I mean, to the middle and and, and have a compromise on some issues and an individual should not insist that this is the way I want. If, if you're not giving me, if I can't get this, then I'm not going with you or I'm not, I, I, I'm leaving. No, I think all of them should come together and this is the time to do that. For Wiki, yes, Wiki can, you know, we know who, who, the Wiki, who, who Wiki is, it will go on like that. But the truth is I don't see Wiki like someone that will leave PDP and in the end, it, we, we've had, we did, PDP has had a tough one. Even in 2019, it happened. So they've had a tough one in the past, and they settled it. And I can see that happening again. And I'm sure Wiki and Atiku will find a way, and every other uh, aggrieved members of the party, they'll find a way of settling this. And I can see Wiki working with Atiku and working for the party. All right, finally, before I let you go, Mr. Olainka Daniels, the party campaign kicks up on the 28th of September. Some say they are expecting action plan rather than the usual manifestos from the candidates. What are your expectations from them? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I hope that uh, this time it will be different. And uh, as we can see that uh, a lot of people are, I mean, uh, interested now. A lot of people, uh, I'm showing sure they're showing interest and in what they want to hear, they want to hear ideology. They want to hear manifestos. They want to hear what you can do. And maybe the t we should say that the time of just gathering drums and, and call, calling different uh, I mean, music, musicians to come and sing and using style to abuse themselves, you know, during the songs and all that, uh, or this one wants to show, and the next thing, they are distributing salt, sugar, and 1,000, 2,000 there. I think uh, people are getting wiser, uh, uh, and the way, the, 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 the atmosphere right now, I doubt if it's going to go that route. And I think for all political parties, what I what I would advise they do, they should, I mean, present what they are for us to the table. Let people hear from them. Tell us what you want to do, where we are today. You, we want a better Nigeria. We want to go beyond where we are today. Then who... What can you do? How can you push it forward? We want efficiency. We want we want result. Enough of sugar and milk. Enough of carrot, uh, dangling carrot, uh, stick and carrot. No, we want result. So if we if all this party bringing, if if they are party of ideology in the all first right, place, Mr. you must see running from Thank you one for party your to the other. We are if almost we out of and I think it's a better deal for us if we are really ready to move forward. All right, the party thank should do the need. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you for having me. All right. And finally on the show, Nigeria's inflation rate has surged to 20.52% in August, the highest since September uh, 2005. The inflation figure rose from 19.64% recorded in Jan uh, July, according to the details of the inflation figures published by the National Bureau of Statistics, MBS, on Thursday, the new inflation rate uh, raises concern in Africa's biggest economy, placing pressure on the APS bank to increase interest rates. Well, joining me in the studio for this discussion is an investment strategy manager at Afrinvest Asset Management Limited. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. All right. The 20 0.52% inflation rate is the highest uh, since September 2005. Things are obviously not getting any better. How did we get here? I think, um, well, the first thing that comes to mind when it comes to this high level of inflation is the fallout from the Russian Ukraine crisis. You know, a number of countries, economies, and governments are deducing what is happening to price level to, to that factor. But for Nigeria, as a matter of fact, it's quite clear that we were not prepared for that kind of shock. Uh, we should have been prepared for it but because we saw a shock in 2020 that led to you know, a major uh, increase in prices. 
and that should have actually helped us to you know to plan for something of such but we didn't prepare ourselves quite well and um, so apart from the exogenous factor which is um, the impact of the, the war on on the items you know food items and other um, components of the cpi that is the consumer price index you have about 12 items in the um, 12 categorization in the cpi basket it's actually called the classification of consumption according to purpose right so we saw you know major increase across those items but proud to the russian ukraine problem in fact proud to 2020 we've been seeing significant increase in prices you know at some point we alluded it to uh, border closure and a number of other factors when the northerners said they were not bringing food to the south so we've seen series of domestic shocks before the so and um, again if you look at a number of other countries right we have more than 10 20 countries with inflation below 10 percent for instance china less than uh, you know three percent same with japan in fact south africa inflation is less than 10 percent as a matter of fact russia where we have major crisis we've seen sanctions here and there inflation is currently decelerating because of the fact that the economy risk sector is working quite well so i think apart from the fact that you know the exogenous factor affected domestic prices who were not prepared yeah, on, on two angles one in terms of energy security and food security energy security i mean you know ability uh, you know affordability and assessing energy in terms of pms diesel and all that we still depend on importation and when it comes to food supply as well you know it's very sad that nigeria depend heavily on importation despite the arable land so for food security you know food is not affordable and in terms of access as well people don't have access to adequate food so it's not about the price it's all about you know affordability so i think all of those concerns are what is what is actually playing out now beyond you know the russian ukraine crisis because what comes to mind or what an average person will tell you is that oh it's as a result of the current you know crisis and um, how it has you know driven prices but I think we have existential problem that we need to address in Nigeria. All right, still speaking of food um, inflation rate, as of August uh, 2022, was at 23.12%. Mm. What are the implications of this on the citizens? It has, you know, grave implication on the citizen. If you look at household, you know, currently purchasing power is declining by the day. Purchase by mean the you know the quantum of goods and services you can afford with your income. If you use um, GDP to proxy in income, because GDP is a proxy to you know national income, GDP has only gone up this year by maybe about three percent. The recent number we saw three point five percent. So an inflation is up by you know up by twenty percent. So if you look at that, income is not rising, but prices are rising. That is a sure recipe for for you know poor standard of living that's on citizen and you already know that once that subsists it will lead to you know major social crisis crimes you know everywhere as you can see that a number of urban area states they are you know the level of crime has increased astronomically and it's as a result of uh, you know uh, lack of you know affordability right that is on the on, on the household part and if you look at businesses as well it's taking a toll on cost of you know cost of doing business you will see a company now that deliver very impressive return. But when you get to the bottom line of the company, I mean profitability, you know, in, uh, cost of doing business would have, you know, taken virtually everything. In, in not just cost of items, in fact, cost of getting um, credit facility as well. Because as inflation is rising, um, you know, uh, lenders as well want to get high interest rates. And if you want to borrow, you want to uh, borrow money for investment at high interest rates, then it will take a toll on interest expense. All of this will dovetail into, you know, uh, strength margins for companies and for government as well. You know, before the, uh, before we saw this current inflation level last year, the budget was was about um, maybe 14% for, uh, for inflation. But this year, we've seen, we are looking at 20 percent so far this year and that means government will not be able to achieve you know most of the planned budgets on the one hand if government is not able to make a lot of money from from companies private organization or you know companies generally as a result of low profit because government get taxes from household if people are employed you get personal income tax and um, for companies as well you get the uh, company income tax so if households are not getting jobs 
if companies are not delivering profit, it will take a toll on government revenue. Government will not get enough revenue. As you can see that uh, fiscal deficit is rising significantly because government is not getting enough revenue. On the expenditure side as well, if government has planned for this year that the, the expenses will be 12 trillion, you already know that because of increase in inflation, they will need much more. As revenue is declining, expenses are rising, widening deficit will continue to be a major challenge to the government. And if you look at international trade part, how is inflation affecting it? It's actually taking a toll on what is happening in that part because if um, manufacturers are not able to produce adequately because of high cost of raw material it will affect exports and once you have you know if export is not competitive if our export is not competitive it's going to affect you know our, our, our trade position negatively so uh, it's actually very important that we begin to look at how to address inflation inflation because you can destroy you know an economy by just causing price instability beyond just Boko Haram or a form of uh, uh, terrorism. Inflation alone can destroy any economy because it will create instability, heighten the rate of crime, and a number of other areas will be negatively affected. Okay, all right. Finally, I would like to fi uh, find out from you, already you've mentioned um, the problems and possible solution to all of this, but what, can, what really do you think we are not doing right as a nation and how realistically do you think this can be addressed? I think we have to focus on productivity. Nothing brings down inflation beyond productivity. It is a function of demand and supply. If you want prices to come down, supply more. How do we ensure that productivity in the nation is, is driven substantially from manufacturers? What are their challenges? They talk about FS challenges. How do we address that so that they can actually meet local demand? We talk about food inflation at record high, 205, you know, highest in two, since uh, 2005. So how do we address the challenges in the agricultural sector? We talk about how insecurity has impeded performance in that space. We talk about lack of financing as well. So once we are able to address all of this problem, I think we are heading in the right direction. And in terms of money supply as well, because money supply is also one of the drivers of inflation in Nigeria. Money supply is growing at an average of 10% per annum, and productivity is growing by just 1%. So that is, we have so much money in terms of and chasing available goals in Nigeria. So I think the CBN has to also ensure that, yes, money supply is properly managed, while the fiscal authority addresses you know, sectors of the economy that can increase productivity. Productivity cannot be increased by just pumping money, or we have to look at how to drive productivity because once we have adequate supply of food, once we have adequate supply of energy, and uh, in terms, yes, and they are affordable because affordability is also a concern. Once they are available, we can bring down prices. So I think it has to be uh, a collaboration between the federal government and the central bank because they, we talk about the monetary part. So I think once they work together, we should begin to look at, you know, uh, near single digit in, say, three to five years because currently... Uh, you know, uh, we have to put a lot of things in place. And lastly, I think I should also mention the impact of mm -hmm. insecurity because whenever I have the opportunity to talk about uh, uh, inflation and economy, you know, growth and all that, I also explain that insecurity has to be addressed. Otherwise, because we know that northerners, uh, you know, they do a lot of farming and all that, how we are now, because of um, the insecurity, a lot of these farmers are in IDP camps. So how do we use money supply? How does the CBN uh, use money supply to ad address insecurity? So I think we have to address that in addition to supporting sectors, manufacturing sector, agricultural sector, so as to, you know, drive productivity. All right. Thank you very much for your contribution, Mr. Tomito May. You're most welcome. All right. Thank you also for being part of the show. And that's our show for today. Remember, you can follow the conversation on our social media platforms at TVC News NGO on our website at tvcnews.tv. I am Jacinta Ubiuku. And until the next week, it's goodbye.